Physics time. No, that's what we say. You say it. Physics time. Physics time. Let's try to do it in creepy unison last, next time. Oh, we don't need to write physics. We already know it's physics. Physics time. Yeah. Okay, the objective, as, as we talked about before, is calculate, describe, and model projectile motion. So let's instead label this projectile motion. Of the ocean. Projectile motion. Of the ocean. Real quick, conceptually, what's a projectile? Something that. An object. Okay, good start. That moves. Launched. Okay, good. Launched. Through the air. Through. No, or through, we could, it could be in a vacuum, but through a medium, we could put that. Even, we can kind of loosely define a vacuum as a type of medium. But an object launched, so it's traveling under the influence of force, but a force, the force that was giving it its launch is no longer acting on it. So the object was a force, the launch was a force at the beginning, but no longer in effect. What, what force is acting on it still? Gravity. Yeah. Still, affected or effected? Affected. Affected in this case by gravity. Still affected by gravity. So what forces in total are acting on this object in the real world? Gravity, gravity and in the real world, air resistance. Um, a lot of times we negate the air resistance, especially for this we will. But that's why uh, the air resistance is why if I throw two things out of the projectile, my cloth and my marker, they go different distances because the air resistance has counteracted the effects of the fabric. It has the marker too, but it fa affected the fabric more. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. They both had gravity acting on them, but this one had the stronger influence of air resistance. But in both cases, the force that was giving them horizontal motion was the same. I threw it. So the, the projectile starts out with, uh, has a horizontal and vertical, what we call components of motion. How do we express the horizontal usually on a Cartesian coordinate system? The what axis? X, X and the vertical? Y. y. You'll sometimes, occasionally, you'll see uh, what we think of as, you know, the world. We'll think the ver people will indicate the vertical as Z, and then horizontal, well, north-south as X, and east-west as Y, which is also fine. Horizontal is usually, when we have just two dimensions, which we were talking about here, like when we talk about it two-dimensionally on a two-dimensional Cartesian grid, we talk about the X being horizontal and the Y being vertical. We'll also sometimes look at this from a top down and say that the Y is northwest, or sorry, northwest, north south, and the X is east west. I mean, in that case, the Z would be the, the vertical axis. But either way, we're we're working with components. What's a component, just in general, not just in physics, but in general? Something that makes up another. Yeah, thing. a thing that makes up another thing. Um, and so in this case, the the motion is composed. It has the components of a horizontal and vertical. What force? When when I first let go of those two objects. No. Right before I let go of those two objects, what force was compelling them in the horizontal axis? Before you let go? Yeah, right before I let go of them. What force was acting on the horizontal axis? Your hand? Yeah, my hand. I was, I was providing a push force to them. What force was acting in the y axis? Gravity. Gravity. Um, and then at, right after, and then from then on, what force? only a Y component. So when an object is in there is no force in the X axis. Except there resistance. Are you still I know, we usually do, but you should be aware that it does exist, but uh, we, don't, we don't calculate it at this level because it's, it's somewhat complicated. Um, but there is a force there, we just are going to choose to neglect it. We call this neglecting, I call it negating sometimes, you'll hear me say that. Your book calls it neglecting, and so I've been trying this 
last several, several years, to use the word the book court uses, we're going to neglect air resistance. We're just going to pretend it doesn't exist. And then right away, right after it says that, your book goes in and talks about airplanes and the vector that chooses are air resistance and the motion of the plane. But anyway, um, usually we neglect air resistance. The thing we have to do when there are components of motion is we must add those components. So I'm going to erase all of this real quick. Is that okay? You have all this information? Yeah. Okay, and, and you can always go back and watch the video so that you have this again. So um, we're going to have a little subset of this. And this, this subset applies not just to projectile motion. We're going to be doing this for ooh, the foreseeable future. No, well, that's not true. For the next several months, we're going to be doing this kind of thing, which is called a vector addition. Vector addition. Define a vector real quick. We just did the bell work about this. What's a vector? Uh, something with a quantity, not just something, yeah, so but a quantity, quantity with magnitude and direction. With magnitude and direction. This becomes important because quantities that just have magnitude, quantities that just have magnitude like mass, when we add those things, it's super easy. Um, let's say mass, or mass. Ty has a mass of we'll say 50 kilograms to make it easy, and Levi has a mass of 75 kilograms. So if Levi hops on Ty's back, what's their combined mass? Super easy, 50 kilograms plus 75 kilograms equals 125 kilograms. When it's, when it's just magnitude, what we call a quantity, by the way, that's just magnitude, do you remember? Scalar. Scalar. Scalar quantities we just straight up add addition. We do the same thing for vectors if Add vectors arithmetically if, that's a huge if, if what? What has to be the same about them to add them? The same direction. Yep. If they act in the same direction. Is that mathematically? Yeah, arithmetically, like okay. just arithmetic. I think it's actually supposed to be arithmetically. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, Levi's in his 18 wheeler. Is that how many? No, it's more like this, isn't it? Would that be 18 wheels? No, two, four, six, eight, ten. ten. I have to have more up here? No, there's only like. There's four, four. No, there's six on the truck, 12 on the truck. Golly, really? Uh-huh. Perfect. <laughs> so they're, they're dual, yeah, you're right. They're dual axis, right. they have four times. So it really should be like this. I've kind of drawn it poorly. <laughs> I'm getting the education, too. There we go. There we go. Okay, Levi's driving his 18-wheeler. I work for Walmart. In a specific, well, you truck drive it, and you contact out with Walmart. <laughs> And he has a specific velocity. We'll say he's moving 30, just to make it easy, 30 meters per second. That's roughly 60 miles an hour. Um, 30 meters per second. Okay? It's a velocity because what? Because it has speed and direction. No, it's a speed and in a specific direction. Okay? And now let's say that there's a tailwind of 5 meters per second behind him. As a side note, I'm all, I'm all about these side notes, when we draw the arrows, there are a couple ways to add vectors. In one way, you have to be very precise with the length of your arrows. But I just, because we're going to do it a different way, I just draw them, up, you know, this one's 30, so it should be longer than this one. The arrow of a vector quantity, the length of the arrow represents its magnitude, and the direction of the arrow represents direction. Let's write that down real quick. When diagramming vector quantities, I'm just going to forget that B, the length of the arrow, what am I implying here? How long? Yeah, well, or how much? I'm implying that vector quantities are indicated by an arrow. The length of the arrow is its magnitude, and the direction of the arrow. I've already said it, but guess what it means? Direction. Yeah. Is its direction. This becomes extremely important because one way that we can add vectors. Uh, which is not the way I prefer, but one way we can add them is to precisely measure them to scale and precisely measure their angle and then draw, add them together through a diagram. 
I consider that the way like a third grader would do it because it involves a lot of angle measurement in drawing, precise drawing. Third graders really probably wouldn't be very good about it. But there's a better, I think more elegant and also slightly more complicated, which makes it fun, uh, way to do it. And you don't need to be quite as good an artist, which I'm a great artist, as you can tell. But you don't have to be quite as good an artist to do it this way. Anyway. Hey, mine also has 18 wheels. How are these things, what is the direction, how is the direction of these related? They're in the same direction. Same direction. So if it's the same direction, we just add it as if it were scalar quantities. So in this case, 30 meters per second, right, plus 5 meters per second, right, equals 35 meters per second, right. Okay. Do you, I'm, I'm guessing right now, would you subtract if it's going the opposite direction? If now, <laughs> bless you, if now he has a headwind of five meters per second, now 30 meters per second right, plus, now check it out. Five meters per second left. Five meters per second left, but if, we're, if our reference direction is right, My negative, negative five meters per second right. Right, because it's, it's, it's actually moving left. The, the wind is actually moving left in our diagram. But we can also express 5 meters per second left as negative 5 meters per second right. So now we get, what? 25 meters per second. Meters per second. Right. Still right. Still right. Fairly easy. Right? That we, so when, we, when, when they're in the exact same direction, we just add them. When they're in the exact opposite directions, we just subtract them. Subtract them. Subtract them. Subtract them. And then, oh, and this, this little thing here, this 25 meters per second, the, the solution, mm -hmm. oops, I should have done it here. Okay. The solution, we show as an arrow that should be roughly the scale. And this arrow, the, the solution and its arrow is called the resultant. That should be a fairly easy word to understand because it's like the result, right? So we add components and the solution is the resultant, okay? These two things are components, and the answer is the resultant. Oops, I erased the word component. So the components make the resultant? And the components added together make the resultant. And the reason we don't just call them, you know, like, I can't remember what, what do you, we don't call it a sum and... Product? No, addors maybe? I don't know. Why? We don't call these things the normal math term because we're doing a different, con, uh, procedure with them. So the components add up to make the resultant. Now, once again, remind yourself, when you, when they're in the same direction, just straight up add. When they're in exactly opposite direction, straight up to try. The, the, I was going to say the difficulty, it's not really difficult, but the, the interesting bit comes when they're in, when they're at angles to one another. Because we have to incorporate how those angles factor into this. One way to do that, the way your book shows you, is called uh, the parallelogram method, which is where we... Yeah, it's confusing. I mean, we're just going to talk about it. We're not really going to do it. We're just going to talk about it. What we would do is if we had some quantity at some certain angle, we would have to measure this angle exactly, and we would have to measure this quantity exactly. We would use a ruler in the protractor. I would say this is... 23 centimeters, so maybe that 23 centimeters represents 23 meters per second. This one is going to be 20 meters per second. And then we have to actually measure the angle between them two. And then we make a parallelogram out of it. We would have to make these exactly parallel. And then the diagonal of that is the resultant. Okay, that's the concept behind what we're doing here. And then how would we actually find the resultant? Well, we would measure its length, which here I find to be 33 meters per second. And then we'd also have to find its angle. I don't know exactly what it is, but we'll say roughly 26 degrees. Do you understand conceptually what this is about? You don't have to know exactly how to do it because this is not how I want you to do it. But the parallelogram method has us measuring angles exactly, measuring the lines to scale, which represent the vector quantities, making a parallelogram, and then measuring the diagonal. Does that make sense? If they're exactly perpendicular to each other, if they're exactly perpendicular to each other, 
it's a 90 degree angle between them. What kind of, what special case of a parallelogram is this going to be? Square. A square. And then the diagonal of that will be a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. So this is a right triangle still. And this hypotenuse is going to be square roots of two, square root of two uh, times whatever the quantity x was. It's going to be x square roots of two is going to be how we find the hypotenuse of that. That's all fine, but here's how I want you to do it. I'm going to leave this up here just for reference, but here's how I want you to do it. What we have to do is we're going to use something called trigonometry. Do you know about trigonometry? Do you all have your calculators with you? So we're going to first, the first step is we break each component into x and y components. Then we're going to add together all x's and all y's. And then we're going to make a new triangle with the sum of the x and and the sum of the y. And then we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to determine the resultant. And then we're going to determine the angle. At steps 1 and 5, we're going to be using trigonometry. Is that sum of x and sum of y? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I forget the u. This capital Greek letter sigma yeah. is, means sum of. So, if you were doing so in this example up here, this is sigma Levi plus tie. Right? It's the sum of the masses of Levi and tie. What's the thing in between them? This is, the, this is supposed to be an ampersand. <laughs> Oh. Whoop. There we go, it's a little better. And we'll do an example of this. I just want to give you a brief outline. And so this, I would say this is even probably, this is certainly more complicated. We have to use our calculator more than the parallelogram method. And it will be slower at first than if you were doing the parallelogram method. But for one thing, it's, uh, it's more foolproof. You'll be able to tell if your answer is wrong more easily. Um, and for another thing, once you get good at it, it'll actually be faster. And it's just a formula to follow. It's slightly more complicated, probably a bit more complicated than V equals V over T, for instance. But it's the same kind of idea. Do you have all this stuff written down? Not yet. I'm trying to find a new pen. And we'll get back to projectile motion here real quick. But I just want to show you how to do vector addition first. Oh. Good? No. No. Yes. Um, I'm going to erase what's up here, at least. No, no. Up to four. So you'll have a problem kind of like Levi is driving truck at 30 meters per second. A ram crashes into the truck at 10 meters per second, which is fast for a ram, and an angle upward from the horizon of 10 degrees. Find the resultant velocity. Levi is driving a truck at 30 meters per second. A ram crashes into the truck at 10 meters per second in an angle upward from the horizon of 10 degrees. Find the resultant velocity. <coughs> Helpful to not draw a diagram first. I would recommend always drawing a diagram. Unlike the parallelogram method, you don't have to make sure your diagram is perfect. perfect. So we have one velocity, 
What's our what's our one velocity? Thirty meters per second. So we're going to draw an arrow of thirty meters per second. We're also going to draw an arrow of ten meters per second. Come and add it. Yeah. Ten meters per second. Oh, this is I'm kind of doing a part of what's called tail to tip method here. It's like half the parallelogram method, where instead of drawing them at the same vertex, you draw them tail to tip. Yeah, and you can do this way by measuring to scale the lines and the angles as well. But I'm just going to show this problem with this 10 meters per second. And this angle should be 10 degrees. The horizon here is this dotted line. So we have two quantities. We have truck, 30 meters per second, ram, 10 degrees of 10. This, it was implied that Levi's going horizontal. So what's the angle here? 180. The angle is 180. So we have two quantities. We need to break each component into x and y components. The one of Levi's truck is easy. What's the x component? 30. x1 equals 30 meters per second. y1 equals what? Zero. Yeah, none. x2, the ram, is what? Well, we don't quite know yet, but we're going to find it out in this way. Mm -hmm. so we're going to do y2 also. x2, if we make a little triangle, I'm going to zoom in on this bit. If we make a little triangle of 10 meters per second, and 10 degrees, there's an angle theta here holding it together, theta, or sorry, 10 degrees. What? Have you ever done trigonometry at all? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so write this down, I'm gonna write this down first. So, ka, to, what? Some old hippie caught another hippie tripping on acid. So, ka, to, what? Have you ever seen this, Levi? Ty, you have. Levi That's okay, don't worry about it, just write it down. It's an acronym. <laughs> Some old hippie uh, caught another hippie tripping on acid. We did it for like one lesson last year. Yeah. So write that down first. And what does it actually stand for? Sine. You can remember it the cool way I just told you. Sine yep. equals opposite over hypotenuse. Yeah, let's, all, let's all write it down together. Cosine Sine equals, equals opposite over hypotenuse. Okay. It's only worse. Only works when. Uh, with right triangles. Right triangles. Don't try to use this with an, any triangle other than right triangle. That's why we can't just draw this line here and use Sokotoa to measure the hypotenuse. Does not work. Has to be a right triangle. So we use the right triangle to break these components. Sorry, well they are components, but we use the tri triangle to break these quantities into their components. So sine equals opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine. Cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent, oops, over hypotenuse. And tangent equals opposite over adjacent. Opposite over adjacent. And we abbreviate these things. Sine is S-I-N, cosine is C-O-S, and tangent is T-A-N. If I hear you pronouncing this word sin, I don't know if people do this. They don't usually call this cos and tan, but a lot of people pronounce this sin. You use these words. You just abbreviate them like this when you're writing. So you still call it sine. Cosine and tangent, you just abbreviate it in that way. That way, you give us like a detention. Yeah, no. Um, so then to find x2, since which one of these components that makes this up is the x? The path that Levi's traveling, right? No, of, the, of just the ram. Oh, just let, the me, let me enlarge this so it's easier for you to see. So my hypotenuse of this is 10 meters per second. I've made a little triangle. Oh, so it's the. So it's that. And no, then my it's, angle it's here the, is the one below. We don't know it. Yeah, it's yeah. horizontal. So this is x, and this is y, right? Yeah. I know the hypotenuse. So which one am I definitely of the Sokotoa? Which one am I definitely not going to use? Since I know the I know hypotenuse, the tangent. definitely not going to use tangent. But if I'm worried about the x, which one am I going to use? You're going to use uh, adjacent. Opposite okay. over. Yeah. No, no, no. We're using ten degrees. So cosine. Adjacent cosine, because it's adjacent. So I'm going to use cosine. So if cosine. Cosine of angle theta equals adjacent Gosh. over hypotenuse. You see in theta. Theta is just the standard variable for angle, or x is the standard variable for a zero quantity. Theta is the standard variable for an angle. Cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. How will I rearrange this to find the adjacent side? Not very hard. Hypotenuse. You don't have even even. You don't even have to show this every time. I'm, we're just gonna. I'm just gonna show this once. So we're rearranging it. So the hypotenuse times cosine of theta equals adjacent. So what I write on my x2 is hypotenuse, in this case 10 meters per second, times cosine of angle 10 degrees equals x2. Then I solve that. 
And here's how I solve it. I take out my calculator. When do we do the last time? Yeah, I'm good. I take out my calculator. This one's dead. You take out your calculator. Ensure that it's in degree mode. At some point this year, we might use radians, but for now, ensure that it's in degree mode. How do you check that? Is that uh, second, it's mode. It's mode. It's mode. You just yeah, second mode. math, I think, is mode. mode. And then make sure it's in degree. Uh -huh. That's mode. probably why I couldn't solve it. And then press enter. Make sure you highlight degree and then press the cosine. Yeah. So then we write in 10, cosine 10. Cosine 10. Uh, 9.8480. Okay, now let's just let's keep it to around three or four decimals. 9.85. 8.48. 8.4. 8. 8. 8. 9.848 what? Degree. No. no. Meters, we're doing meters, meters per, per second. second. Okay, and now, well, how are we going to find the y component? Well, looking back at our triangle. Well, now you can use the cos. Yep, so watch. No. No, I mean tangent. Nope. Sine theta equals opposite. You could use tangent at this yeah. point, but we want to use, since this was the given, so you and this value isn't exact, we want to use. Uh -huh. So you still use the hypotenuse because it's yeah, the given? Because the hypotenuse is the given. You could do it the other way, but this is how I prefer. So a hypotenuse now times sine of angle theta will give us the opposite side. So we're going to write in the hypotenuse again, 10 meters per second. This time times sine of 10 degrees gives us... Mm, let me see, just one second. Okay, yeah, 1.736 meters per second. So now I've done step one. Break each component into x and y components. My components were Levi's truck, number one, the ram, number two. So far, so good, right? And I broke them into x and y, x and y. Now, I add together the x and the y. I'm going to, I don't really want to erase my problem, but I don't want to erase my steps either. Can you go over here? I don't even know if the camera can see me over here, but I guess I will. If the camera can't see me, the camera can't see me. Um, so now I have, and don't you don't go over here. You keep writing underneath it or to the left of it or to the right of it. But now we have the sum of the x equals, well, what are my two x components? Uh, x1 is 30 meters per second. 30 x meters per second. 9.848. Plus 9.848. Now check the heck it out. Because we have broken these into components, what did we say at the very beginning is the only time we can add vector quantities? When they're in the same direction. When they're in the same direction. And since we're only talking now about the horizontal part of this one that was in an angle, we can add them together arithmetically. So we add these two together and we get 39.848 meters per second. And that's the x component of our resultant. What is it? This is going to be the x component of our new triangle, the resultant triangle. Now we have some of the y. Well, that's pretty easy. Zero plus 1.736 meters per second. The sum of the y equals 1.736 meters per second. Step two. Add together all of the x and all of the y. Hold on, hold on. That was step two. Show you rules here. You see where I got the numbers from? Yes. And do you see why we can now add them together? Yes. Mr. Khan, can we have just added 30 plus 10? No, you can't add these because they're not in the same direction. We have to break them up into components that are the same direction. Straight up x and straight up y. Now that we've added them together, we make a new triangle, the resultant triangle. We're going to have our y component is 1.7. This obviously is not to scale. And our x component is 39.848 meters per second. There are a couple ways we can do this. I prefer the Pythagorean theorem, but we now have what? Look at it. Side, angle, side. We know this is a 90 degree angle, and we know two sides, so we can find everything else out about this time you're trying to look. What is this going to represent? What is the hypotenuse going to represent? Um, the ram hitting you? Yeah, it's the resultant. It's the, it's the new velocity of those things being put together. The resultant is going to be the hypotenuse. So how do we find the magnitude of the resultant? Yeah. We could use, well, well, we could do Pythagorean. The Pythagorean here is what I prefer. Sine so we know that a squared plus b squared 
equals c squared. So then the square root of the quantity a squared plus b squared equals c. So you type in your calculator. Here, actually how I would type it in is I would type in the quantity, or you could even just do it like this, 39.848 meters per second squared plus 1.736 meters per second squared, and then raise that to the one-half power. How should this number compare to both of the others? How must it compare to both of It has to be larger. It has to be larger than them. But it can't be as large as them both just straight up added together. 39.886. 39.886 is the length of the resultant side. 39.886. Now we're only missing one thing. Oh wait, 39.886 per second. Meters squared. per second. But we're only missing one thing about our triangle. What else do we have to find out? We have to find the resultant velocity. So now we have the resultant speed. Direction. We need to find the direction. We need to find the angle. So how do we find an angle from this? Um, you can use any of the trigonometric identities. Oh, and just solve for We're solving for the angle. So here's how you type it in your calculator. You type in, uh, mm, oh, let's just use cosine. Cosine negative one. This is called inverse cosine. It's not one over cosine. It's inverse cosine of, the, then you type in, since cosine is adjacent to over hypotenuse, you type in the adjacent side, 39.84. Is that raised or is it? Meters per second, yeah. Cosine to the negative first times the quantity what, whatever cosine is, which is adjacent over hypotenuse, 39.886 meters per second, will give us theta. And in this case, theta equals? 2.501. 501 what? Mm, degrees. Degrees. 2.501 degrees. Now we check for reasonability. Oh, that's, that's six. Check for reasonability. Don't this. Sorry, Ty. <laughs> Um, it's kind of, this six is a loose step. We don't always have to do this. But if Levi's driving a truck with a large velocity that's entirely horizontal, and a ram with a, runs into it with a smaller velocity at a very low angle, would it make sense for this angle to be even lower yeah. and for the speed to be not quite if they were both added together? Yeah. If the ram had somehow like sprang forth from the depths of hell and done an 80 degree angle instead of a 10 degree angle, we would have found this angle to be larger and we would have found the resultant speed to be less. Okay. Break each component into x and y components. That's what we did here. Add together the x and the y, which we did over here. Make a new triangle out of the, the sum of the x and the sum of the y. Sum of the x and sum of the y. Use the Pythagorean theorem to find the resultant speed, and then use trigonometry again to find the angle measure. Can we have a practice where we will. We will definitely do many, many, many of these. There will be some on your test that we're going to do many. Your bell work probably for the next, I might have your Retract review will be due Monday, and your bell work will just work on these for the next couple of days. Let's move back to why does this matter for projectile motion? Okay, while I erase this, you tell me. Why does this matter for projectile motion? That's what we started with? That, okay, yeah, that's what we started with. <laughs> that is part of the reason why it matters, or at least that's the reason we did this. But why does vector addition matter for projectile motion? Because... Well, was there a projectile in that example just now? Well, the, the truck after the ram hit it. Okay. We obviously didn't take into consideration the mass of both those things. That quantity is called momentum, and we will do that later. But there was a projectile. The, the truck, right, it was moving yeah. under the influence of gravity, and it had a force at the beginning, the, the ram uh -huh. moving it. Uh, uh, okay, so we're seeing, like, if you were to throw it, that your hand throwing would be the ram. Yeah. Okay. So just like... The reason vector addition matters for this is because projectile motion, write this down please, I can't yet because I'm not done erasing, but projectile motion has an x and a y component. Projectile motion has an x and a y component. Tell me when you finish writing that. X and y what? Component. Projectile motion has an x and a y component. The x component is what? 
Horizontal. Horizontal. And the x component is as if, the whole thing we're negating air resistance, but the x component is as if that object had just been rolled on a frictionless surface. So here's projectile motion. Let's pretend, like me throwing the marker. Here's the marker. Here's the x component, here's the y component. The x component is the same as if the object were rolled. And just like we're negating air resistance, we also negate friction. Same as if the object were rolled. The y component is the same as if what? Project. It was dropped. Yep. You've probably seen the Myth Mythbusters thing where they talk about this, but um, it's not hard to believe if I do it this way. Your book even has a picture of this. Hey, camera, we're going to do it. Ready? I'm going to drop one and launch the other. And it seems to us instinctively like the one I throw should take longer because it's covering a greater distance. But watch what happens. Ready? They're the same. They're always the same. And in the same way, Mythbusters did this thing. It wasn't even a myth, it's physics. But if you fire a gun, even though that thing is going at a tremendous velocity, if you drop the, the bullet at the exact same time, that bullet that has gone out of the gun, that has been fired from the gun, will land at the same time that the bullet dropped will. Mm -hmm. It's uh, well, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it is crazy. But uh, the horizontal component, let's write this down. The horizontal component has no effect on the vertical component. Is it effect or effect? In this case, it's effect. The horizontal component has no effect on the vertical component. They're completely independent of one another. Other than they, they're happening to the same object. So they can the vertical one affect the horizontal one? No. Most importantly, the horizontal component of motion for a projectile is completely independent of the vertical component of motion. Each component is independent of the other. Their combined effects produce the way, sorry, produce the variety of curved paths the projectiles follow. Look with, look with me on page 34. I'll show this to the camera. Hey, camera, look at that. The red ball has been dropped, and the yellow ball has been launched. And you can see they have those white lines to indicate how far it has fallen. And it uses time lapse to show that at every interval of time, like the, the camera took a picture every, whatever, hundredth of a second. And at time one, they're both on the same line. And then at time four, they're both on the same line. You see? I don't see. So if we had, do you not really? Or are you just making a joke? I'm making a joke. Oh, yes. Yeah. In the, how far, look at that picture and look at what I'm trying to do up here. You see the picture in the book? Yeah. What do you notice about just the vertical component? They both have a vertical component, but what's true about it? What's it doing in the vertical component? Falling. Yes, falling, so it's doing what? Free fall. Free fall, so it's doing what? Speeding up. Yes, it's accelerating. Yeah. In the X, or sorry, in the Y, it's accelerating. That's specifically how? Uh, 9.8 meters per second. 9.8 meters per second squared. Specifically how? Has to have a direction down, oh, always yeah. down. Accelerating 9.8 meters per second squared down. What's it doing in, in the x? In minus two, where it's supposed to be. So it's going faster and faster in the y. It's See, there's more and more distance between them. And in the x, what's it doing? Slow down. No, it should be, and I've kind of drawn this poorly, but it should be the same distance every time because what's it doing in the x? Speeding up as well. Nope. Slow down. Nope. Moving. Nope. Uh, well, moving, yes. But <laughs> is there a force acting in the x direction? Air resistance. There is Remember, we're negating air resistance. Is there a force acting in the x no. direction? No. no. So is there acceleration in the x direction? No. No. So it's, it's no, not doing nothing. It has like constant. 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 
constant acceleration? Velocity. Constant velocity. It's moving the same distance in the x every second that goes by, or every hundreds of a second, or whatever it is. What? Oh, are we? I was going to ask you, last thing, what, what angle, and you can read about this on page 36, but what angle produces the greatest height? 45 degrees. No, the no, greatest height, height. 90 degrees. Height. Greatest height, 90 degrees. Greatest distance away? 45. 45 degrees, because it allows it to have more time in the air. Even though the y component doesn't affect the x component, the y component is what determines how long it's in the air. Let's write that down real quick. The y component, because it's the component that has the acceleration of gravity, y component determines time in the air. What do we call time in the air? Hang time. Hang time. So we're still going to be calculating hang time, except now we're going to be able to apply that also to the distance that's covered. So the point is we have a, a, the constant velocity in the x. So if we're moving it 30 meters per second in the x, and it goes for 10 seconds, it's gone 300 meters. If it goes for 4 seconds, it's gone for 120 meters. So the greatest distance will be 45 degree angle. That's why in like Lord of the Rings or something, when they're going to all launch their bows, or even like in World War II, they all had their rifles, and they were just going to volley it. They weren't aiming at anything specific. They just wanted to get as far as possible. Everyone aims at 45 degrees. It was a long, 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 long ways. Uh, read about satellites in your book. The bell has rung. Make sure you do your assignment. It's due Monday. <laughs>